Welcome back, young scholars. In this video, we will be discussing the Meiji Restoration. It'll be the first in a number of videos about the 19th century and the responses to industrialization. And that intro song should have more appropriately been called Things Keep Getting Western, because that ultimately is what the Meiji Restoration was all about. So the big questions you should be able to answer after watching this video are first, what problems were faced by China, Japan, Russia, the Ottoman Empire and Latin America in the 19th century, and how did they respond to these problems? And this video will in particular focus on Japan, and then what caused Japan ultimately to westernize, and then how did Japan westernize? So in the 19th century, we have spent a time focusing on how European countries and the United States engaged in policies of imperialism and were able to conquer the vast majority of Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Oceania. Now we want to focus on the rest of the world. So we're going to spend some time in the 19th century thinking about China. And today in this video, we'll be focusing on Japan. Then we'll look at the Ottoman Empire, Russia, and ultimately Latin America. So I think it's fair to say that Japan, China, the Ottoman Empire, Russia, and Latin America all faced internal and external threats in the 1800s. Internal threats could be something as simple as like a rebellion or an uprising. They also faced external threats, mainly from European powers in the United States who were intervening sometimes and, and meddling in their affairs. So ultimately, in each case, we are going to see these societies undertake a series of reforms. Some of these reforms ultimately will leave the society stronger off in terms of increasing their industrial capacity. We're going to see that with Japan today. Some, however, become weaker as a result of these reforms. We'll see that with respect to China and the Ottoman Empire. So last time we were in Japan was in period four, and we were discussing the social class hierarchy as part of this era of feudal Japan. So remember, we had the emperor, who is just a figurehead ruler at the very top. He had no actual real power. The real power in the feudal period was possessed by the shogun. He was both a political and military leader. And so he would be the most powerful person in both feudal Japan. And then especially later on when power is concentrated in the shogunate, you had the daimyo, who were local feudal lords, who in the feudal period were fighting and vying for power on the local level. Below them, you had the samurai, these Japanese warriors. Below them, you had the peasants, the farmers, and at the very bottom, because they're just like China, you had merchants. Now, from 1603 to 1868, you'll recall from the last video on Japan, you had a shogun named Tokugawa Ieyasu, who eventually was able to consolidate power from these local daimyos, and he ushers in a long period of stability and centralization. He issues all kinds of rules to control and curb the power of the daimyo. And so we see one unified Japan from 1603 to 1868. Now in the 1600s, the Tokugawa shogun adopts a series of isolationist policies, similar to what we saw in China. And we've already discussed this um, with respect to the fear that Christian missionaries played and the idea that um, Japan wanted to maintain their traditional cultural values and they were very concerned, uh, the shogun was, about Christianity coming in and potentially shaking up their society. So in the early 1800s, Japan begins to experience a number of problems. At first, the Tokugawa shogunate was fairly successful because we see this end of the, the civil war period in Japanese history. But ultimately, because of Japan's isolationist policies, they no longer have access to technology and ideas from the outside world. And so they begin experiencing a number of problems such as famine and high rates of taxation. So in response to this, the shogun offers a number of modest policies. Ultimately, they are unsuccessful in addressing the issues that the Japanese society was facing in the 1800s. And it is into this world in the mid-1800s that this guy steps. Not this guy. Let's try this guy. This is Matthew Perry, 
the original Matthew Perry, Commodore Matthew Perry, the captain of a series of U.S. steamships that in 1853 show up in Tokyo Bay and demand that Japan opens up trade and starts to trade with the United States. Because remember, Japan was totally isolationist. They only allowed the Dutch to trade for a limited period of time, for like one week out of the year. And the Japanese were very fearful. You can see these are uh, images of Matthew Perry and his steamships from the perspective of the Japanese. Now remember, they, they have not industrialized yet. And so as they see these ships billowing black smoke out of their steam engines, you can imagine that would be a pretty uh, daunting, intimidating sight. So you can see again how uh, Matthew Perry was not exactly painted in the best light. And that is because when the U.S. showed up, they handed them two objects. They handed them a, a treaty that they wanted them to sign or a white flag. And the idea was that if they refused to sign the treaty, eventually they would need the white flag because U.S. steamships were equipped with significant guns. This is sometimes referred to as gunboat diplomacy because when you show up with bigger guns, sometimes you can you know, encourage others to do things that they otherwise might not want to do. So ultimately Japan does sign the treaty. The threat of U.S. ships caused Japan to sign what is essentially an unequal treaty, allowing the United States to begin trade relationships with the Japanese. And the reason they do this, as we'll see later on, was because they had seen the example of China. The Chinese and the British are going to engage in a very similar relationship. And ultimately the outcome, as we'll see for Japan, was a little bit different. Now, many Japanese were ultimately humiliated. This is a very proud traditional culture and society of sort of samurai warriors, and they ultimately want to modernize and westernize. And so the saying that I oftentimes like to refer to is, if you can't beat them, join them. So they wanted to become more like the West. And that leads to a massive transformation of power in Japan. So remember, the shogun had power in the Tokugawa shogunate, but as a result of a uprising, we have a group of aristocrats in Japanese society who ultimately remove the shogun from power and restore the emperor. Because remember, the emperor is still around, but he was just a figurehead throughout the feudal age in the Tokugawa shogunate. Well, now the emperor actually does have real power, an emperor named Emperor Meiji. Now, Emperor Meiji will engage in a series of transformations or changes. He essentially gets a makeover to make him appear more westernized. So you can see traditional Japanese clothes, traditional Japanese hairstyle and hat. And you can see as a result of this transformation, he adopts more Western style clothes. You can always tell military uniform in this period should scream out Western. You can see his you know, more traditional Western style haircut. And so this is a period of Japanese history known as the Meiji Restoration. And it was this rapid industrialization that was ultimately led by the state. And if you're looking for a difference between the way industrialization took place in Japan and the way industrialization played out in Western Europe, this is one of those big differences. When it comes to industrialization in Japan, the state was sponsoring and supporting most of the industrialization. So the state, the government, was building the steamships. The government was building the railroads. Whereas in Western Europe, most of that, because they're following capitalist principles, was done by private businesses. Now, Japan is also going to adopt a more Western-style constitution. They adopt a more parliamentary form of government. And so they really wholesale embrace these ideas of Western principles. Now, Japan is going to quickly build up its military because it has industrialized and it is going to win a series of wars, first against the Chinese, 1895, known as the Sino-Japanese War. Sino is just short for Chinese. So the war fought between the Chinese and the Japanese, the Sino-Japanese War in 1895. And it shows just how successful Japan was at industrializing relative to the Chinese. And then also they fight a series of war against the Russians in 1905, the Russo-Japanese War. And again, the Japanese are successful and they produce a series of propaganda images. This is an image showing the Ch uh, Chinese who are being defeated by Japanese forces. And so uh, the, the, the success ultimately of the Meiji Restoration can be measured by the fact that 
Japan was able to successfully become an imperialist power themselves. So Japan is seen as an emerging threat to Western nations. It's one of the reasons why Western European nations form an alliance with Japan in the run-up to World War I. And Japan becomes an emerging industrial power. They adopt a policy of imperialism. They even adopt some of the ideology of social Darwinism, right, that Western European nations had adopted, that, that they were a biologically superior ethnic group. And so we see that same thing in Asia between various Asian nations. The Japanese will assert over the Chinese and the Koreans that they are a biologically and culturally superior ethnic group, and they will begin building their own empire across East Asia and the Pacific. So that included taking control of the Korean Peninsula and also control of Manchuria up here. And one of the reasons why Japan wanted to, wanted control of these other territories is because as an industrializing nation, what do you need? Resources, raw materials, and there were lots of good farmland and other raw materials available for the Japanese in Manchuria. The Japanese also adopt an imperial flag. Uh, this is known as the rising sun flag. And if you ever come in contact with people from East Asia, this is a very contentious part of their history. And so particularly people from Korea and China, to them, this flag is almost as offensive and has as much deeply rooted meaning as, for example, the Nazi flag has. So the goal ultimately of of Japan was to increase their natural resources because they are rapidly engaging in industrial production. They're trying to build up their textile factories, their railroads, their steel industry. And so those resources were available over in China since Japan is just a pretty small isolated island. So as a result of watching this video, you should be able to answer this first big question about what were the problems faced by, in this case, the Japanese in the 19th century and how did they respond to the problem? What caused Japan to westernize? You should be familiar with the United States' role in opening up Japan and forcing them to sign a series of unequal treaties as a result of Matthew Perry and those gunboat diplomacy. And then how ultimately did Japan westernize with the Meiji Restoration and the success of that process had in Japan as evidenced by the Sino-Japanese and Russo-Japanese wars. Thanks for watching.